National Skyline, Part 1. A stone, a leaf, an unfound door, of a stone, a leaf, a door, and of all the forgotten faces, naked and alone, we came into exile. Thomas Wolfe. Look homeward, angel. Chapter 1. I, John Gabriel Rutherford IV, scion of a once noble southern family, adjust my steadfast telescope onto the distant double star Sirius. Silence looms all around except for the occasional clang of barges, the occasional shouts of men carried by the brisk wind over the nearby river. The crescent moon hangs low above the horizon, forming a thin, rippling streak of light across the icy waters. Shadows of barren trees recline on all sides, protecting me from the earth below. The bitter wind numbs my cheeks and pervades my scorched nose with the burning smell of winter. As I stand on my secluded roof, I feel as if I am suspended in a womb between the heavens and the earth, but present in neither one. Isolated and alone, my senses miss nothing. I can feel the granules of the shingles pressing through the firm soles of my leathery boots. I can smell the pungent odor of hickory smoke in my ragged sweater. I can see the reflections of single stars in the river beyond. In the dim light, I employ to adjust the telescope's dials. My warm breath fills the air with every exhalation. Looking down at the reddish glow of my waxen hand, I wonder if I am just a phantom in another dimension of the universe, a nightmare in someone else's dream. My bones ache from the need to convince myself of my reality. The stars convince me of my reality. You see, I'm a watcher. I have always been a watcher and I will forever be a watcher, incapable of the kind of action the heavens demand. And yet, the possibility remains that I can act, that I can join this world and assume responsibility for myself as well as for others. But now I am just a cosmic voyeur, a peeping Tom of the universe. I should be struck down by the gods for gazing upon so much history, upon so much splendor and magnificence. I see every star I look upon as it existed years and years before. Even the light reflected off my hand is from the past. You see, there is no present. It is just an illusion. The present implies a time full of pleasant possibilities for the future, a time where every step signals the beginning of an infinite number of steps from which to choose, a time that someone can take with such ease that he does not even have to be aware of, his, of its existence. But in this world, I do not have those infinite possible steps to embrace. I exist on an imaginary tightrope and must watch every step lest I fall into the cold, dark abyss. I live in constant fear of the future, in fear that the inevitable will take place. And I live in constant fear of the past, in fear that what has already happened will happen again. How can the present exist in such a world? As I look for Sirius, I ponder what the reserve scientists would say about this beautiful star. 
They would tell me that it is the brightest star in the sky at magnitude negative 1.46, that it is nine light years distance, or 50 trillion miles, and that it is orbited by a white dwarf star that gives out one four hundredth as much light as our sun, but is 30 times denser. A pint of this dwarf companion star would weigh almost 25 tons amazing even to us watchers. Now, a scientist finds Sirius by going into his neat little lab packed full of pristine scientific instruments. A stained coffee pot brews on the warmer and a tiny refrigerator hums in the corner. The aloof scientist saunters over to his beloved computer and punches the following into the keyboard. Right ascension. Six hours, 45 minutes, and nine seconds. Declination, negative 16 degrees, 42 minutes, and 58 seconds. Motors begin to whir, and now if the scientist should happen to look through the eyepiece of his telescope, he would see Sirius. But chances are that he has absolute faith in his computer and complete trust in his telescope. And at once, he begins spectroscopic recordings, photometric readings, and infrared photos. Instruments flash with multicolored lights. Tape drums hum, shutters click, and miles and miles of data pour forth on the little strips of paper and magnetic disks. Once the recording of the data is complete, the cold scientist deigns to look through the scope, as if to pat himself on the back and say, this truly is serious. But believe me, he will have seen everything and anything but serious. But when I look at serious, I first look at Orion, a man of great stature and beauty. I feel the pain and sadness when he was blinded by the king of coyotes for loving the royal daughter. The joy when the son restored his sight and the tragedy when Diana was tricked into slaying him on the eve of their wedding. I see the tears flowing down Diana's cheeks, tears more sorrowful than earth has ever known. As the waves roll by the lifeless body of great Orion upon the sandy shore. Delicately, she lifts her departed lover, kisses him on his cold lips, and places him in the heavens for all to see. What an unselfish gift for Diana to bestow upon the dead Orion, to bestow upon the ones now living. There stands mighty Orion in the sky for me and everyone else to see, wearing his lavish girdle and dazzling sword his poised arm holding an immense club above his head. The pleiad nymphs of Diana fly before him, and behind follows his faithful dog, Sirius. Inhaling some cold air, I scan toward the southern horizon in a line formed by the three stars of Orion's belt. There is Sirius, bright and beautiful and majestic. I then admire the semicircle of stars stationed around Orion. First, there are Castor and Pollux, the inseparable twins, one immortal, the other just a man. And next, there's Procyon, the little dog whose appearance heralds the imminent arrival of Sirius. After Sirius is radiant, radiant Rigel, the left foot of Orion. I return to Sirius and wonder about the unseen companion star, two mismatched lovers forever circling each other. Now I am ready to spy upon Sirius, the faithful dog star of Orion. I hold my breath in eager anticipation and lower my head to the naked eyepiece. My blonde hair stands upright on the nape of my neck 
I can feel the prickling of starlight all over my sensitive skin. Tears rush into my fervent eyes. I see it. I see it. I see a gunshot rings out. The heavens and the earth disappear. There is only the here and now. My weighty heart skips a beat. The cold air cuts to my impenetrable bones. It has happened. I have been a watcher for too long.